Hello and welcome everyone on Seagull 2023. I'm Andrew Tropin, I work on operating systems and programming languages and do a lot of free and open source software development along the way. Today we will discuss how to use only one programming language to create and maintain the whole operating system distribution. And the obvious question is why we would like to do it. Nowadays, in most cases, at least for power users and probably for people who are attending this conference, using an operating system is almost equal to developing of operating system. When you change a line in the configuration file, you update the source code of your operating system. If you install a package, you implicitly, in the worst case, modify the dependencies of all programs, uh, edit the source code, edit the headers and other stuff at the same time. By the way, do any of you wreck the whole uh, root directory in version control system? Probably not. And because of it, you don't actually know what happens with your system when you perform some commands. For example, when you do apt install or apt upgrade or other commands, your operating system is modified and it migrates to a different state, but you're not sure what things happening behind the scene. So in most cases, working on operating system today looks like a building the big software project that you use daily, but with worst possible development practices. You never have a shippable solution. The only thing that you can ship is your own machine, your laptop or whatever you use. But if you migrate to another laptop or if you have a hardware broken or something else happening with your machine, you lose the whole software project that you've been working on for years. And I guess if your past self could provide a maintainable system instead of a pure mess to your future self, the future self will be infinitely happy about it. But how we can achieve it? For this, functional package managers comes into play. What is main idea of a functional program? That you have a lot of pure functions that accept some inputs and provide some outputs. If they accept the same inputs, they provide the same output. They don't have side effects. They don't touch network file system and so on. And it's very good. Uh, such pure functions are very predictable, easy to test, and has a lot of nice properties. But how to apply this idea to package management? Imagine that if the build process of your package will be just a pure function. You can enforce it by programming language, but if you have a general purpose a programming language which allows arbitrary side effects, it will be quite hard to do. So the other option is to run a build process in some kind of sandbox with no access to network file system and other side effectful things. And this way you guarantee that if your function executed successfully, it's probably uh, did it in a pure way. So basically what package in such package manager would look like? It will be a combination of few things. Some meta information like source code, dependencies like libraries, compilers, and so on, and the build phases, the pure function itself. So having this pure function and all the inputs, you can run this function on those inputs and get the final result. And the final result will be just a directory with a list of files. But you can uh, say that, you know, if you have a directory, it's already a side effect and so on. Uh, this directory was created in a sandboxed environment, and after that, it was copied to the our actual uh, file system. So during the build process, no files on your actual hard drive wasn't touched. It could be even done in, in memory. Okay, the question is how to make sure that we provide the same input inputs every time to this pure function. One of the possible solutions is to attach some meta information to every package definition. For example, a hash of the source code. So every time you download a uh, source code, you can check if you downloaded the same uh, source code by comparing the hash. It is, it is quite a good solution and uh, covers a lot of cases. Uh, but another question is, for example, you have a compiler as a dependency for, for a package and uh, you have a hash for this compiler uh, source code, but somebody should build this compi compiler somehow. And here you have two options. You can go further and get the previous version of compiler that was used to build this compiler uh, and go up uh, to the very small binary of 300 bytes. Uh, and this process, is actually almost complete by bootstrapable project. You can see the link at my screen and you can visit the site to learn more about how the whole bootstrap uh, from very small binary seed uh, is done on Geek's operating system and uh, near this project. And the other option is to have a much lar lar larger binary seed. For example, you uh, give up in this bootstrap process and just say, from this point, I don't go further to a smaller and uh, older version of compiler. I just take a big uh, binary uh, file and accept that it's my binary seed for the whole uh, building process. Those uh, approaches uh, have downsides and benefits. In most cases, if you have a bootstra bootstrapped uh, build from the very small binary seed, you can tr trust the whole chain of those builds. But it's a little bit of topic. It's very interesting, and I encourage you to visit the site and to learn more about it. Uh, let's go to the packages and to the programming of our operating system. 
I already mentioned a few times a gigs. It's a functional package manager written in Guile scheme language. It has a nice API that we will explore right now, and uh, we'll do some practice with package API. Uh, let's start from a very simple example. Uh, we have here on the left the source code. On the right, you will see the results provided by the source code. I will restart the session. Uh, I will evaluate the expression which says display high. On the right, you can see the output and you can see the return value. Also, I can try to divide zero by zero. I will get a backtrace and uh, some error message here. Okay, so good so far. We can also run an infinite loop which prints uh, some values. I can interrupt this infinite loop and uh, do some other fancy things. Uh, I can use models that can be provided by, for example, RD project or Geeks project or maybe some libraries and so on. And I can uh, use values defined in those models. For example, in GNU packages admin, I have htop package defined and I can evaluate the value and see that in memory I have package object which resides on this address. Uh, okay, what can I do with this uh, package object? I can get the home page of the package. It's just a basic string which have an HTTPS address. I can get a package source and as a package source, uh, I will get a region which contains some meta information about the source code. Here you can see the URL of repository, you can see the commit, uh, actually it's a tag, not exact commit, uh, and you see the content hash. So when I download the source code for building this package, the source code will be compared against this hash, and if it differs, that means that something uh, happened with the source code we downloaded, maybe it was changed on the remote server, maybe it was man in the middle attack, or something else. So the build process will fail if the uh, hash of obtained source code doesn't match with the hash uh, provided here in the meta information. Also, I can uh, have I can find the source code for this package, but before that, let me evaluate this uh, helper function and let's evaluate symbol file name call on htop package. I hope it was not too quick introduction because it's a little bit of a lisp here, but don't worry too much. It's uh, like a very basic constructions. You have a function name here and arguments here and everything enclosed in the parentheses. It's not something uh, hard and I already used to it so much, so uh, I forgot to give a small introduction into it, but basically it's just a little bit different syntax for writing the usual expressions that you use in almost all programming languages. So the only thing that you basically need that here the first position is a function name and the rest is the argument. So it's basically the same as writing display high in your usual programming language. Okay, I hope it will be enough. I evaluated symbol file name on htop uh, and I got as a response the path to the source code. And let's take a look at this file. You can see that here we uh, have a definition of a top htop package uh, which has a few fields specified like name, version, source, and so on. The source, as you can see, like uh, the URL and the hash and other uh, fancy things uh, here, some meta information like homepage, synopsis, description, and license. But what we are actually interested in is a pure function itself which provides a build operation. And uh, here we use a build system. It's a predefined uh, set of steps which do the build process. For this case, it will be dot slash configure make make install. And as inputs, we have nkrcs after conf after make and a few implicit uh, inputs that are actually comes with a GNU build system like C compiler. That's um, the source code and how it looks. It's quite readable even if you don't know the Lisp syntax you can see. On the left you have a field name, on the right you have a value and that's basically it. Okay, let's go further. Uh, we have our htop package, we know that it has inputs, native inputs. Let's just uh, write a simple uh, script that we will print uh, them to stdout. And here we go. We have nkurses as an input, and you can see that it reference another package. So we can go deeper and inspect uh, nkurses package and obtain it a uh, homepage. Let's do it. So we have package inputs, and in package inputs, we can take a first element of it using car function. And here in car function, we will we get the list which contains a name and the package itself. The package itself will reside in the second part of the list. So to get it, we will do a little bit of car and CDR uh, magic. You can treat uh, car as a first uh, function and CDR as a last function, a uh, rest function, uh, which operates on list. And here you can see that we got a package and curses as a result. We can take package homepage out of it and get HTTP address for incurses project. That's it. And we can go, go further and explore our uh, packages this way, but looking at source code, not very interesting. Uh, let's actually build something. And here I have a very simple call to build with store uh, helper function and I provide emacs next pjtk x widgets uh, package as argument to it. Uh, and let's execute it. On the left you see that something happening and it's actually downloading the source code. But I have very slow internet connection at the moment so I won't be doing it. I will interrupt the evaluation and I will execute the builds uh, with store function uh, for another package uh, which is slightly different version of emacs. Uh, let's execute it. Obviously, we expect that it will download uh, the source code the same way as it did for the previous one, but here we can already see that it returns the result. Why it happening? Because our build 
pro procedure is actually a pure function. And if we build it once, we don't need to rebuild it. It's reproducible. So I can just use already stored the value that was built previously from the same inputs. And I can be sure that the inputs are the same because they has have hashes and those hashes didn't change uh, since then. And another cool property of this reproducible builds that you can build the package on the CI and download binary from it and be sure that it is exactly the same package uh, that you have package definition for on your local machine. And it can make it easy to offload uh, CPU intensive from your laptop to servers, from your development environment or uh, continuous integration environment to some other places. And if uh, I have a slightly different build input, I build the same package with a different version of compiler or something else, I will get as a result a different package which stored in a different location and it won't collide with the previous uh, package that was built previously. And I have much more benefits from the build process being a pure function, but I won't be going too uh, deep uh, in this topic today, but you can find a lot of related information in official manual or in some materials that I provide for you during the streams or my articles. Okay, what else we can do? We can take a package source from each top package and you can see that we uh, get a region again from here and I can build it. So the Gix returns me a directory where the actually the source code of htop resides. Uh, so let's go to the settings C uh, file and we can see that there are a lot of C function definitions which are necessary for htop package to work. So I want to demonstrate the power of interactive development with a functional programming combination which makes it very easy to build very reliable reproducible packages just with a simple few lines of code. And I hope I succeed with it. Uh, also, I can build another thing. I can build uh, not a package, but some file-like object and a local file function uh, which accepts a pass to the file or directory can also provide a file-like object that I can build. And here you can see that it returned a result. Let me evaluate it again. Uh, it returned a result and I can navigate to this directory and see its structure. Actually, it is what we have here uh, in the directory specified as a local file argument. And I found even demo SCM, which is the same file I had here. Uh, the funny thing is that I will execute this build procedure a few times. You see that it produces the GNU store item, which has the same, absolutely the same hash. But if I add a simple empty line to the file, which is located in this directory, and our current demo SCM file is located in this directory, the build result will be different. The hash will be different. So if some package depends on this package uh, will be uh, built, uh, and we change anything in our uh, input package, for example, we add a simple uh, empty line here, our resulting package will also be changed. Okay, let's see what we also have. I have a very simple G-expression. The G-expression is basically the same as a scheme code, but it will be evaluated on Geeks build daemon. Uh, you don't need to understand all the details. Uh, it's basically the same thing, but it can capture values from the current environment and evaluate them on the remote environment. That's basically it. And here I just create an expression which returns a pass to Emacs object. Uh, do you remember that we, uh, we've built Emacs PGTK X widgets? I will build it one more time here. Uh, you can see the output here. Let's see uh, what it contains. It contains a bin directory with some binaries, which are result of the uh, build process for this package and some other uh, additional stuff like documentation, maybe some libraries, configuration files, and so on. And uh, what uh, I want to achieve with this simple G expression, I want to get, instead of directory, I want to get a pass to uh, our Emacs binary. So I add to the final, uh, to the uh, directory where, where the result of the build for this package uh, resides, I add slash bin slash emacs and I store it to the variable. And later I will be able to reference emacs x widgets bin in different examples. Okay, uh, we evaluated this G expression and you can see the result with pk function I printed as a result and actually I can execute this binary right, right now. I can just copy it to my terminal and execute it. But what I will do, I will use the power of the scheme language again and I will just call a system asterisk function and provide it a few arguments like the pass to the emacs and a few arguments to it. And uh, what I will do next, uh, here I have my usual emacs and inside this usual emacs I have x widget webkit browse url function and I try to call it and uh, I don't know, let's say seagull org. I try to open seagull org inside x widgets browser but you can see I get an error, error uh, which says that your emacs was not compiled with x widget support. So you know that our package that we have here called emacs x widgets. So probably it compiled with write, write flags and has x widget support. So let's execute it and let's pass uh, a simple code to it, which just basically do the same thing as I did manually here. And as you can see, a new Emacs instance was spawned and inside this Emacs instance, the single page was opened and I can scroll it and navigate and see anything here. Okay, very nice. But we are not restricted restricted with only built-in functions in this language. We can provide our own. For example, here I have very simple wrapper which redirects std out of uh, launched process uh, into 
into the pipe and from the pipe we can read and print it uh, using a custom formatter here and let's see how it works we run another emacs instance uh, from our guile code let's uh, make the window a little smaller and uh, let's print something to oops to stdr uh, everything that goes to stdr goes directly to our mm -hmm. REPL, but everything uh, that comes to std out first will be wrapped in a string here uh, oops you can see the format uh, sharp t std out from process and let's actually execute this line everything that comes to uh, std out will be first wrapped in uh, our custom formatter that's how you can combine the power of general purpose language with api of functional package manager and get ultimate power okay how much time do we have probably not that much so i will try to go further and explain how the actually the distribution of operating system built out of this small building blocks what i have in my notes uh, actually your operating system is a software project and here you can see the uh, structure of example configuration it's quite simple uh, it contains basically a few files for example some host specific uh, or hardware specific configurations here some user specific configurations here and some log files here which uh, actually provides us package definitions that we will be using for building our operating system distribution okay uh, a few more lines here our whole operating system uh, will contain a collection of packages which combine together and put in one directory and activation script the activation script basically either sets the environment variable in your shell to make those packages available in your shell those binaries and libraries and so on or it simply links necessary files to necessary places in case of activation of the whole operating system or your home environment you can learn about uh, this process in the geeks manual and uh, i will just demonstrate how the whole definition of operating system looks like by calling this pretty print function for oops rd configuration and scrolling it up here you can see a lot of different values defined and out of those values you can actually understand what uh, is inside my operating system you can see the host name time zone uh, i don't know email email so show me the email my email full name and other stuff also you can find a lot of uh, package definitions here for example password store uh, value contains a reference to the package object that we were working previously with and out of all those small pieces one by one we get a little bigger pieces like profiles which is collection of packages and out of the profile and activation script we get the whole operating system of home environment uh, and you can actually uh, build it in a functional way it will produce the directory we call the activation script and everything get uh, activated and available in your system uh, you of course can operate on it programmatically you can access different values of it using uh, the api or the functions you will find somewhere or create uh, yourself and of course you can build the whole operating system using the exactly the same uh, api and here i built a home environment which is similar to operating system but only uh, touches your uh, user's home directory not the root directory but you can do the same for operating system okay the build process may take some time and you can see that how everything builds It generates all the things all the things that i basically use uh, during my daily life uh, and it provides us a hash and inside this hash you see the directory which has an activation script uh, which has configuration files and all other fancy stuff okay the most interesting part of our today talk is actually removing parts parts from our operating system you can see how my basic emacs looks like and i will take a configuration and will instantly remove appearance and fonts parts and also i will remove Sway notification and we'll try to rebuild it and uh, to rebuild it i will use a command line instead of api interface but it do basically the same thing and here you can see the problem uh, that transmission actually requires a notification to be present but a notification is not present anymore because i removed them from the list of uh, items in my operating system uh, and to fix this issue i will remove the transmission transmission tool but uh, what uh, how i could else uh, solve this problem i could provide a desktop notification with other feature uh, which for example uh, gnome notification diamond or something else and after i removed uh, the, the option is of course re remove transmission that complains about uh, not having desktop notifications and what i expect after removing all those features that i will have a bare bone emacs with uh, almost all appearance related settings and fonts removed and also I expect that notification icon here at the top uh, at, uh, the, at the bar will be removed as well and all notification related will disappear from my system and you can see the icon disappeared notification doesn't work anymore if i i, I send them with uh, this simple thing oh it still works okay probably the diamond not shut down it uh, automatically but it happens with a live demo uh, it happens okay let's see what happened with emacs and now my emacs looks like very basic emacs with default fonts with default settings is and with no fancy things things that i usually have in my usual emacs 
and you see that some problems with uh, fonts also appeared because I, I removed feature fonts and now instead of uh, fonts uh, we have empty symbols but uh, if we use our updated max instead uh, of uh, UTF Unicode symbols you will see a usual pipes and it works uh, quite well so live reloading may be uh, an issue but it's more an issue of respect uh, uh, of the programs not uh, of the package manager uh, and that's basically it. I hope uh, my internet connection will allow me to uh, join you live and to answer your question. But if not, you can always contact me via email or Fediverse. You can use this contact here. Whoops. This contact here. And thank you for your time. And I will see you in a bit.